Dick Revis, who is our featured speaker tonight, uh, is 72 years old. He's a retired journalist uh, and author. He lives in Dallas. Um, he's a veteran of the Southern Civil Rights Movement, uh, where he served in Marengo County, Alabama, from 1965 to 66 with the uh, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, uh, MLK's organization. Uh, he was a member of the Austin chapter of Students for a Democratic Society, uh, which is going to be talking about mainly tonight. Um, in subsequent years, uh, he was active in not one, not two, but three Marxist-Leninist parties, um, <laughs> which should be another very exciting topic that we'll get into. Uh, today, he's a member of uh, DSA, Democratic Socialists, and he sees a lot of parallels between uh, the DSA and left organizations of the 1960s. Um, 1968, um, as you know, was, was a high point of rebellion in the United States um, and internationally. Uh, but the problems that uh, confounded the socialists of 1968 uh, still confront us today. Uh, DSA, you know, like every other uh, left organization, socialist organization, is grappling with these issues. Uh, but like, you know, these organizations that sprung up in the late 1960s and early 70s, uh, we could also stumble if we make some of the same errors and mistakes. So that's why we're here today, to kind of learn from these uh, challenges that they came across. Uh, some of the things that Dick mentions that he may talk about are formalism, factionalism, and impatience, uh, these perennial maladies of the left. Um, some of these are already evident in our ranks um, as natural. Um, it says the, uh, the selected writings about the life cycle of SDS and the challenges of 1968 are likely to engender questions from their readers about similarities between then and now. So based on his experience as an advocate of socialism, uh, Comrade Revis will um, answer those that he can. So let's give him a warm welcome. Over. And we'll have we'll have a time for questions and answers uh, after. What do you say about twenty minutes? No, we'll Whenever try. you're through, okay. Take it away. Um, let me start by asking how many of y'all are members of DSA? Okay, good. Because it's it's with DSA in mind that I've been thinking the last few months. Um, I, I attend the meetings, generally know what's going on, began to see troubling signs. 1968 cropped up, and I began to ask myself what the similarities might be. The first thing that has to be said is that DSA is a group more advanced than SDS was. First of all, it more or less thinks that the working class is the agency for change here. Secondly, it calls itself socialist. SDS never did. Uh, thirdly, SDS, at least in Texas, was highly bohemian. I mean, and we were, the Austin chapter was a hippie chapter and by reputation an anarchist chapter, though I think that word isn't, I think it referred only to our method of organization. <clears throat> I was a typical middle class, upper middle class, uh, southern white, Texas white, in 1965, and was attending a college called Panhandle A&M in Goodwill, Oklahoma which had a sign at its entrance, progress through education, T-H-R-U is the way through was spelled. <laughs> it was a rodeo school um, where my father had sent me after I got in trouble for being an integrationist at Texas Tech. And one day I was walking into the cafeteria at Panhandle and ran upon a brochure recruiting summer volunteers for the Civil Rights Movement. And I was a good young Democrat and kept up with things and knew enough that I wanted to go immediately. That decision was made. And I wanted to go with SNCC, 
SNCC Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was the Green Berets of the Civil Rights Movement, or the frontline troops. Dr. King's group was a little, they, we called them Student Nonviolent Non-Coordinating Committee, or SNCC. They called us SLIC. And the difference was SCLC was paying $12 a month to its summer, $12 a week to its summer volunteers, and SNCC wasn't paying anything. So I signed up with SCLC because <laughs> I knew I'd need money. Now, $12 a week ain't much, and as my book explains, I never got the one or two checks because they were embezzled. But anyway, I went to Atlanta for an orientation. I went a few days early and went through that first summer through September, typical. I worked in a small town, about 7,500 people, half black. We had to live in the black community. I lived with, a, me and two or three others lived with a, a practical nurse in her 50s. And to tell you what Demopolis was like, we lived in a house of a person who had what would have been considered a good job. We had water in the kitchen, cold. There was no water heater. And that was it. We had a telephone. There was no TV. There was no bathroom. There was an outhouse. And we were in the middle, I would say, of the living standards in Demopolis. This came as a great shock to a lot of us because we were from relatively prosperous families. Not having hot water meant I couldn't shave. So I did what a lot of the black men did at that time. You bought a depilatory cream, a depilatory powder, Royal Crown, which you mixed with water and put on your face and it burned the whiskers off. And it left your skin irritated and red, but it did get rid of them. That's sort of the situation we were in. <clears throat> in September of 65, a little after the Watts riot, I came back to, I came back to Texas and went to UT. And in those days to enroll in college, you had to stand in line, walk up let's say, to the soci sociology department's desk, tell them what course you wanted, they would pull a computer card, give it to you, and then you would go to English or history or whatever else. And when you got all the cards you needed, you went and paid your registration fees. Fifty dollars a month was the tuition at UT at that time. <laughs> they tacked on a couple of fees, but for less than a hundred dollars you got through. That procedure was real good for student organizations because in three days of registration, every student at the university passed out of Gregory Gym after pulling their cards. And there were 30,000 of us at UT at that time. Um, I was coming out of the gym and I saw this booth said SDS, the kids inside of it look like the northern civil rights workers I had known in Alabama. Meaning they didn't look like country boys from Texas. <laughs> they were half hippie. So I walked up and asked them who they were and they said, well, we're against racism and the Vietnam War. And I had mixed feelings about the Vietnam War. I sat down on a wall there somewhere and thought about it a few minutes. And I thought, they're going to be drafting all them white folks out of Alabama and sending them to Vietnam. Ain't no way they're going to, they're going to speak well of us, how do you say, represent us very well. The people in Vietnam won't like us. And I went and signed a membership card and paid my dues. It was an environment very foreign to me. 
I talked to those kids, and because I was coming out of Alabama, they immediately accepted me, and I think accorded me a certain amount of status. And they invited me to come to somebody's house that Sunday. And on my way to work, I stopped by there <clears throat> and found everybody was in an attic, seated on the floor in a circle. So I sat down and started listening, and I don't know what they were talking about. And I left about a half an hour later, never knowing that they were in the attic in a circle because they were passing around a joint. <laughs> I had never seen marijuana. So what you got is a West Texas country boy hanging out with a bunch of urban hippies. And I, that took some adjustment on my part. Um, SDS there, uh, how do you say, SDS is credited with being the biggest anti-war organization. <clears throat> it was not the first. The first anti-Vietnam War demonstration was held by the May 2nd movement in 1964. But SDS had started the spring semester of 65. I got there the fall semester. There must have been maybe 20 of us who belonged to SDS. We hung out at the chuck wagon. We made no, as you say, we hung out with anybody we saw we knew, and it might have been anybody. It was a strange, for me, a strange collection. One day I found myself seated at a table with a man who made and sold speed meth, the first lesbian I had ever known, uh, and a guy who was fixing at the end of the semester to go back to Egypt where he had been in high school. I don't know what his parents did, because he wanted to join the Egyptian army Meaning, in SDS, there was all kinds of weird ideas. <laughs> Anything. SDS, uh, our chapter got its anarchist reputation, first of all, because, and you can be thankful DSA doesn't do this, its method of governance, governance was participatory democracy. That means you call a meeting, anybody can speak, they can say anything they want, and they can talk for as long as they want. What that invariably produced was three-hour or four-hour meetings, and whoever was left at the end approved of everything. <laughs> because, how do you say, everybody was exhausted, and the work was carried out by the people who proposed doing anything and a few of their friends, <laughs> just personal friends. And it all went very well, I have to say. There were a million things going on. If you had a political line, you wouldn't have approved of half of them, <laughs> or you would have thought they were silly. But Everybody did everything in the name of SDS. They put SDS on, you, you want to do something, you go to a meeting, you get the token approval, you print up the leaflet, go do it. And, it, how do you say, the organization grew as the question of the war grew. The, I think 1967, was a key year among the most active elements. SDS was like any other group. Uh, probably 20% of the membership did 90% of the work or made 90% of the decisions. Uh, 67 was the year when I think we began to think about the question of reform or revolution, which is discussed in these papers. And I think we began to think about it because people were nearing graduation and they wanted to know what are we going to do when we graduate. Now the parallel I see with DSA is this. Graduation was for us 
a setback. We didn't want to graduate. We wanted to stay there and agitate and smoke pot and have a good time the rest of our lives, <laughs> right? Graduation meant going out into the cold, cruel world. And we had to decide, there was millions of discussions, am I going to work inside the system or outside the system? And what the hell does that mean? And people, how do you say, the other thing was that we by 67 had two years of demonstrating. And we saw no results. We saw the numbers of demonstrators go, but you didn't see the United States government backing off or the Democratic Party backing off from the Vietnam War at all. Uh, in both Alabama and in, in Austin, we lived in situations where the powers that be would not sit down and negotiate with us about anything. In Alabama, because they didn't talk to black folks, period. If you wanted to march, they wouldn't give you a permit. You had to do it illegally. SDS in Austin lived under the regime called in local parentis, which in those days meant the college could set rules for its students as it pleased. And we just violated it. <laughs> but there was no discussion or negotiation with people with the powers that be. DSA is in a much different situation. You can pull permits today. We get them to leaflet against the fair hike. You want to march, you can get a permit. There are places where you can talk to the people in power and maybe convince them. It's a much different, I would think, a more favorable environment, though the difference is that the civil rights movement especially stressed militancy. It didn't matter what you knew. It mattered if you were willing to face the cops. That was the civil rights movement. STS sort of lighter than that. And today, you can go and demand to speak with boards city councils and so on. It's unheard of back in those days. But anyway, graduation was a setback, and the movement wasn't going anywhere. I think until the fall of 67, we didn't see great numbers of growth. And, and the government wasn't given an inch. And we began to say, why did this happen? and to blame each other. Well, it's because we had a reform program, for example, instead of a revolutionary program. And I think during 67, most of the activists in SDS decided that there had to be a revolution. That was the only way we would ever accomplish our goals. And but most of, most of our followers did not agree with that or even know we were discussing it. Most of our followers, we began to have big demonstrations in the spring of 67, I guess, spring or fall. We could call a demonstration and get 2,000 people to it. But the chief thing on their minds was the draft. In those days, students had a draft exemption, but once you graduated, you went to the top of the line, and there was no lottery. The lottery came along later. So everybody and his girlfriend was worried about the draft, and that built the movement more than anything. That inspired all the anti-war sentiment. <clears throat> 68 comes along, and y'all are seeing something that may be 70% of it now. 68 was a year which, if you watched TV, and by then I didn't, or read newspapers, and by then I didn't, because I had decided they were bourgeois, <laughs> full of propaganda. But ordinary people were turned on the TV every day to see what the hell had happened 
because outrageous things were happening. That's like today. My wife and I turn on the TV every day to see what the hell Trump has done. But there were all, to, at present, we're getting all these right-wing offensives, some of which are pretty shocking. Who would have ever thought they'd be separating children and, and their parents at the border? Things like that. 68 was a year full of events, most of them with left-wing implications, not right-wing implications, uh, like the Tet Offensive, when January 68, Americans discovered we weren't winning the war. <laughs> the assassination of Kennedy, of King, we discovered we were not living in, what's the word? A civilized country, I suppose you would say. Um, I think 60, I don't know if it's 67, 68, Che Guevara was wiped out in Bolivia. What the hell else happened? I've just read all this stuff and forgot it. Before the Democratic Convention, what all happened? Anybody have anything I've left out? Huh? Yeah, that's Democratic Convention. Huh? No, I don't know about that. Oh, starting in 64, actually, there were riots every summer in the ghettos, or rebellions as the left wing called them. And 67 had been especially hot. And then when King was murdered for two weeks, cities burning all over this country. So everybody was wondering what kind of country do we live in, and how long is this trouble going to last? Which is kind of what people are wondering today. <laughs> what kind of country do we live in, and how long is Trump going to last? The Chicago, in August, the Democratic Party held its convention. A lot of people went up there and demonstrated, even from Austin. I did not go because by that time I had decided that the Democratic Party belonged to the bourgeoisie. <laughs> but lots of people went and they showed us at that convention what the Democratic Party thought of its youth wing, beat the hell out of everybody, and nominated a candidate who would not comment on the war. When Hillary refused to endorse Bernie's three demands, $15 wage, Medicare for all, free college, I saw the same thing happen. The Democratic Party spurning its future leaders is what, what it amounted to. And that's what DSA is. People who, if Bernie had been the candidate, would be active Democrats today. That's pretty much what DSA is now, as SDS was in 1965 and 66, and into 67. Now, like I say, in 67, some of us began to have doubts. In 68, a lot of us began to have doubts, most of us. So SDS pretty much decided, the people in SDS, because we had no... If we had a party line, none of us knew it. Austin, S it, SDS had a newspaper, New Left Notes, nobody read it. Uh, in the local chapter, we didn't have a treasurer or a treasury. Once a year, we would ask people if they wanted to join and we'd sign up, sign cards and take dues and send them to the office in Chicago. Uh, we didn't have a president. We rotated who, who stood at the front of the meeting. We had to elect one because the university demanded it, so we elected a cop from the DPS. There was a, two older men who came in suits with briefcases, one representing the Austin Police Department and the other representing the 
Texas Department of Public Safety. The Austin cop we talked to a lot, kind of liked him. The DPS cop was ordered not to speak, so we knew he couldn't decline a nomination. <laughs> we elected him president and turned that into the school as these are our officers, right? It was an anarchist chapter in those senses. Uh, I think what happened was that as the troubles in 68 grew deeper, those of us who had begun to read Marxist literature, and some of us had begun to join Marxist parties, communist parties, I joined the Progressive Labor Party, blamed the lack of our success in building a movement on the other members. Ah, it's because you do frivolous things. Ah, it's because you don't know the working class is the agency for change, that kind of stuff. And in 68, we began to say, how can we change the country? And two tendencies emerged. One was called the Revolutionary Youth Movement. It believed that the revolutionary agency, the people who were going to change the world, were young people. And it says, when you graduate, hang around campus as best you can, and we'll go organize the high schools. That was its plan. Progressive Labor Party said, when you graduate, go get a factory job and rebuild the unions. Build a base in the working class was the slogan. And we began to argue over these things. I think we would have stayed together had it not been for national conventions. But what happened is we had to elect delegates to national SDS conventions. And if the Austin chapter, which was big, had six delegates, each faction put up six candidates. What we should have done was split the difference. You guys name three and we'll name three. But we didn't know any better. We didn't see keeping SDS together as an important goal. We thought the only important goal, at least to those of us on the left end of that deal, was making the revolution. <laughs> And so we began to fight in the chapter over what to do after graduation and, which I think we could have lived with that debate for years, and over delegates. And pretty soon, SDS, not only in Austin but everywhere, was badly factionalized. 1969, new people would come into the chapter and we couldn't even orient them. The first thing we could say is you got to join one faction or the other. <clears throat> and so we were turning away new members because we were preoccupied with who's going to control SDS, which was a funny consideration in the Austin chapter, but I think those of us in PL kept trying to take control of it, and for that I think we were wrong. Um, the situation was so bad that in the summer of 68, PL, the Progressive Labor Party that I belong to, nominated me for the National Executive Committee, and I had to make a presentation or a little speech before the vote. And I got up and said, I believe all of us in SDS should stick together. Some of my best friends are anarchists. I guess that's almost on the lines of some of my best friends are Negro. Some of my best friends are anarchists. I even like the up against the wall motherfuckers, the name of a, an anarchist group at, an, at the national level. When I said that, PL put out the word on the floor, don't vote for Revis. <laughs> my own faction backed off from backing me because I showed 
some willingness to tolerate the other faction. This culminated in the 1969 convention of SDS in Chicago. I want to say that the man who wrote this paper here, Heidemann, which is in Jacobin, gets it right. PL's been slandered widely by people from the other faction in their writings. They say, PL tried to take over SDS, but we saved it. Well, what happened was we won the vote. <laughs> we elected our slate, and then the REM people, the Revolutionary Youth people, went to the office, loaded up the records, and walked out. They, in fact, they had loaded them up the night before the vote. <laughs> but by Robert's rules of order, we won. But that's because Robert's rules of order doesn't take consensus into consideration. It only counts majority votes and 51% as a majority. I want to warn everybody, you don't want to get in that situation. <laughs> um, it's much better just to let anybody do what they want to do, even if it sometimes embarrasses you. After that convention, the REM people, the Revolutionary Youth people, split again, one faction of which became the Weatherman, which became infamous for planting essentially pretty harmless bombs <laughs> at several places and for blowing up themselves. One group of them was killed while preparing bombs, which is what happens when you give English majors the task of preparing <laughs> bombs. <laughs> uh, fortunately, SDS had not been the only anti-war organization. About 66, at least in Austin, the Socialist Workers Party, a Trotskyist group which at that time was very small. Most of its members were from Minneapolis, St. Paul. They came to Austin to recruit and talk. I call them the blue-eyed devils. It was Malcolm's word for white people. But they were blue-eyed devils. They were all like, they were Scandinavian kids. <laughs> <laughs> and they wore ordinary clothes. They were not bohemian. Um, and Anyway, the student mob, uh, the picture run today on the post Ryan made announcing my talk, I got to look at it, looking at it and I knew where it was shot, but it didn't look quite like SDS, the way the people dressed. And I kept looking and I saw SMC on their banners, Student Mobilization Committee. And the banner said something about the My Lai Massacre. Americans didn't know it happened. It happened in 68. But we didn't know that till November of 69. So that's a 1970 picture showing the student mob at least carrying on anti-war work. Those of us in SDS had never really cooperated with the student mob because it was single issue, meaning it wanted to end the war. SDS wanted a new world in every way you can think. I mean, we were against drug laws. We were against marriage. We were certainly formed alliances with the black students, whereas SMC's position was we're single issue. If a Klansman's against the war, we'll take him in. That's what one of the organizers told me. You may say it's not true, but that's no. what I'm telling you. That's exactly what they did. But it was a single issue, and, and the, mo the MOB is the group, not SDS, that staged those big demonstrations in Washington, D.C. They could get more people together than us, but they weren't as radical. Um, let's see if, oh, I want to make a note about this. For those of you who read this deal, which is pretty good, there's a historical era. Both the opening and the closing say that the 1969 convention, 
the members of PL and those in, of REM, of the Revolutionary Youth Faction, squared off against each other. One group chanted, the PL group chanted, Mao, Mao, Mao Zedong. And the, the REM group chanted, Ho, Ho, Ho Chi Minh. This never happened. <laughs> And I can give several reasons why. It did happen that a group that's today known as the Revolutionary Communist Party, they were the Avakianites back then, it showed up at that convention wearing Mao buttons the size of your palm and dressed like hippies. PL was the group whom the Chinese Party recognized as its fraternal organization. But in PL, we didn't wear mild buttons. And for that matter, we had debohemianized. We were all told, you should look, dress about like I am today. We shaved our beards and so on. Because they wanted us to be acceptable to the working class, and being a hippie was not acceptable at that point. So here the Evacian hippies show up with these huge mild buttons and they waved red books at us, and they might have chanted Mao, 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 Zedong, but we didn't chant anything back because we were just sort of dismayed by those people. I remember asking the leaders in PL, who are they? We're the ones the Chinese party recognizes. And how do you say? We, we, we certainly wouldn't have chanted Ho back because Ho was in the Soviet camp and we were in the Chinese camp. So it was, those were the Avakianites. PL and REM had nothing to do with it. Now they, they might have chanted that at REM, but I doubt it because generally speaking, they voted with REM. So there's a historical era in this paper that comes from the long history of slanders against PL. Um, let me see if there was anything else I wanted to bring up about this. If anybody have questions? Yeah. I'm going to confuse my uh, position as a moderator to uh, uh, get you to elaborate a little bit before we go to general Q&A. Could you say a little bit about this, this proliferation of all these different, uh, you know, organizations CS? <coughs> Yep. that kind of continued the, this brand of radicalism into the 70s, some of them uh, going to, you know, various workplaces, various unions and organizing there. Uh, that I think if you read the, uh, the Elbaum book, Revolution in the Air, uh, he describes it as the new communist movement. All these organizations that rejected the kind of old school, uh, you know, Communist Party USA type politics is too liberal and like even more left-wing extreme. Okay, let me go back a few years. There had always been an SDS. SDS was an organization that, like DSA, descended, perhaps through a long line, from the old American Socialist Party. <clears throat> In 1965, SDS, all the Socialist Party organizations banned communists. That happened during, at least by the time of the McCarthy period. Ban members of communist groups from belonging. SDS dropped that ban in 1965, as for that matter, SCLC also did. And so from the first, in SDS, we always had communist members, though they weren't numerous. Um, I joined the W.E.B. Du Bois Club when, about the time I joined SDS, it was the youth group of the Communist Party. And there were, th there were four of us. <laughs> one of us was murdered, the one martyr of SDS in Austin. The Spartacus League was in our chapter. The SWP, the Socialist Workers Party, was in our chapter. Um, the, that may be all. And the general behavior of the Leninist groups was not aggressive. They hoped to recruit from SDS by slowly educating us. And the only group that ever broke with that behavior was PL. 
which they call it Maoist. Um, we were, PL was, a fit, had a fraternal relationship with the Chinese party, but never, you can go look at its publications from that area. You won't find an article about Mao. Never was foreign policy oriented. PL was established by people who left the Communist Party in, in the early 60s because the Communist Party was, as it, I think it still is today, too red for the liberals and too liberal for the reds. <laughs> and it was formed by a bunch of old Stalinists, is what they were. But um, Elbaum, the rest of Elbaum's book, frankly, I haven't read because it's, an, it's a history of what happened to Maoism after 1969. And what happened after 1960, it wasn't after, 19, after November 1968, Richard Nixon was elected. <laughs> that was America's response to the anti-war movement. That was a really big reverse, worse than graduation. And what happened was they adopted a lottery for the draft. That meant that when you graduated, then they pulled numbers out of a hat, and if your number came up, you got drafted. Whereas before, you were pretty sure to get drafted. <laughs> and the anti-war movement went downhill. Uh, and the country moved right. And so what happened, look, it wasn't just through the period of Elbaum's book. Between then and Occupy, there wasn't any movement. There were little groups of co-thinkers. I participated in everything I could, but there was no movement. Now let me make a point here. My second or third day in SELC, I went down for orientation a few days early and <clears throat> walked into the headquarters office in Atlanta and they put me to work immediately. And on the second or third day when all the other summer volunteers were coming around, I was assigned to work with a field staffer, a field staffer being a $20 a week man at SCLC who worked in some small town somewhere who had experience. And our job was to stand on a parking lot at one of the HBUCs and tell anybody who came wanting to go hear Dr. King speak that the location of the speech had been changed to that of another HBUC. So we had to stop people's cars and say, well, if you're here to see King, you're going to have to go to whatever the other university was. And I told this field staffer, I said, I wish I had been able to hear King. And he says, you ain't miss nothing. All they're going to do is talk about where's the movement going next. Hell, if anybody knew that, it wouldn't be a movement. <laughs> That's very important. That was true of the civil rights movement. You didn't know what was going to happen next. That was true of Austin SDS. What the hell are we going to do next? Hell, somebody get a wild hair up their ass and no telling what we'll do. But when things collapsed with the betrayal of the Democratic Party and the election of Nixon and the draft lottery. We weren't, the movement died. And we were left only with organizations. Now, some of those organizations did good work. But movements are characterized by spontaneity, by the presence of people who are not well educated politically or not very advanced and so on. 
What you had until between then and Occupy was a series of groups where people studied politics seriously. And you didn't have movements. I even think, and I don't know what you will say, Ryan, that we use today the word the labor movement, and there ain't no labor movement. There are organizations. That compares to what the new left or the left was in this country between 1969 and Occupy. So we went through 35 years of hard times. During those 35 years, I had quit PL. I moved to New Orleans during the Angela Davis campaign. The Communist Party was doing good work. It was the best racially integrated organization other than the United States Army <laughs> that I had ever seen. So I joined the Communist Party. Went from being Maoist, you would say, to being Soviet line. <laughs> And while I was in New Orleans, belonged to the Communist Party. And then, when I became a journalist, quit. Because journalists in this country are not even allowed to put signs for candidates in their front yards. <laughs> and I thought, oh hell, if they find out I belong to the CP, huh, they're going to fire my ass. So I quit and stayed in touch with everybody. Stayed in the left, did what little I could, attended a demonstration now and then, until about the time of Occupy when I was a tenured professor. Could do anything I wanted to. But there wasn't that much going on. And I had a group of students, or I knew a group of students at my university who came to me one day and said, we're thinking about joining the Workers' World Party. What do you think of it? And I told them, well, you'll learn some Marxism. It won't do you any harm, but you'll be out in three years. I said that because as a veteran of Leninist parties, I'll tell you, they're all pretty top down. And most of them are run from New York. And people in New York and DSA is run from New York. People in New York don't know what the United States is. <laughs> That's, how do you say, their picture of what we should do has historically been bizarre. But anyway, uh, after those kids at, in North Carolina where I was teaching had been in Workers' World for five years, I got to feeling ashamed of myself. <laughs> And they were doing pretty good work. And they, they had all been white at the time I had on them. They had integrated. So I went and joined them. They were Trotskyist. I didn't care. It was, how do you say, I belonged to those three parties not because I thought they had the correct party line or I had any idea what that would be. I joined because they were doing good work on the ground. Same reason I joined DSA. And so I was Maoist, Moscow Line, and Trotskyist. Why? Because those were the people who were doing things. And the one thing you can say in praise of Leninist parties in this country is that their people are committed. They will show up they will do the work, they will make the sacrifices, that's where you get the most militant people. That's why I think DSA shouldn't ban them. They're useful. And I didn't know DSA banned people until I started all this stuff here thinking about 68. And I don't know if I would join had I known, <laughs> though I don't belong to any communist organization today, it just kind of hurts my feelings. <laughs> because they're good, they're as good a people as there are in the world. Uh, now, I got one other thing to say. 
the problem we had in PL and the reason why I left was that Maoism, insofar as PL was Maoist, is an anti-revisionist movement. What, they mean, what that means is they think the Soviet Union sold out in 1956. And Mao sold out in the late 60s. And everybody has sold out except you and me. And I'm not sure about you. It is that line of thought that I think did all the damage was well, responsible for the damage PL did to SDS and to itself ultimately. I left when they denounced Mao over Cambodia. I didn't know what the hell was going on in Cambodia. But all of a sudden it occurred to me that statement. Everybody sold, they said Mao had sold out. Everybody sold out but you and me. <laughs> and I'm not sure about you. You got to avoid that. Us in the left, I think if the truth be told, don't have, if we had the revolution tomorrow, we couldn't run the country. We don't have people who know how to run it. <laughs> That's a big problem. The Bolsheviks had this problem. Furthermore, the future is a mystery to all human beings we don't know, how do you say, we'd have a hard time knowing what to do. To start accusing people of selling out because they think youth or the revolutionary class or any other reason is, Mao would say, to treat a comrade like the enemy is to go over to the side of the enemy. That's a direct quote from Mao. You don't ever want to do that. Anybody who's to the left of the capitalist has to be your friend. Even if you don't agree about things, you should do it like Austin SDS did. Let them go do what they want to. Let them use your name. It's not going to hurt you that much. Uh, there has to be a spirit of camaraderie, a fellowship that's very tolerant at this point. The Leninist parties, some of them at least, don't understand that the party line and party discipline have to grow tighter the closer you get to the revolution. Right now, if your politics aren't perfect, it doesn't matter because we're a long way from changing this country. If you don't show up one day, it doesn't matter that much because we're a long way from getting anywhere. But if this country is headed for a revolution, and I, I still believe there's no other, ultimately it will have to have that. But if it's headed in that direction, discipline and the line should tighten when it becomes a life and death matter. Does that make sense? Because when you're making when you're in combat, if you don't show up, that's important, <laughs> right? If you don't know who your friends and enemies are, you're going to die. But in our situation, we can have great liberty because there's no hope. And when I say I think it will finally take a revolution, you see me wearing a Bernie cap. I would not denounce Bernie for not being a revolutionary. He did a great thing for us. <laughs> DSA exists, according to him. There is today a socialist movement because of that Democrat. All right? You've got to have a broader vision. And I think it, it has to be done on both sides, so the trouble I saw in my life was of the revolutionaries being hard on the reformist and not the other way around. Go ahead. Yeah, let's, um, I think this is a good time to open it up for a uh, okay. discussion. Let's think, think again for setting this up. We're only about, I think we're going to do about 25 minutes of discussion. Is that cool? As long as you, yeah. All right. As long as you guys do. And I'm going to just, if you want to speak.
you just raise your hand. I'm going to take stack so that it's kind of fair. Everyone gets a chance to speak. Well, not everyone. That will take a while. Please keep your comments to about two minutes, <coughs> preferably real questions. Um, and uh, before, who's, who's got a comment? Who's got something to say? Let's see, Taylor, Okay. Go ahead. All right. Um, I, yeah, I have a million questions about the difference you see between movement building and organization building. But uh, a briefer question I have is your uh, comments about the SDS's ineffectiveness in the Vietnam War movement, or anti-war uh, movement. Um, because um, one of the parts I thought was really um, interesting in the Heidemann piece is when he talks about um, the SDS's effectiveness in um, interfering with uh, the college campuses that were being used to uh, draft students into the war. Mm -hmm. And I've read, um, you know, I've, re I've read the idea that like, the reason why the Vietnam anti-war movement was so effective relative to the other anti-war movements is that it not just had demonstrations, but it also had, um, it had like, specific like, agitation, like, um, like um, interfering with the, the war machine, the U.S. Mm -hmm. war machine, and agitation in the armed forces. And I was wondering uh, why you thought that the SDS wasn't so effective in that time, contrary to what okay. uh, Heidemann and other said. SDS, <clears throat> until 19, I mean, while it lasted, was a student organization. The GI anti-war movement, may have started as early as 66 with the Fort Hood Three. Some guys who were members of the Socialist Workers' Party who refused to go to Vietnam and got put in jail. But it didn't, at least in Texas, it didn't really show its face until 68 or 69. And it didn't become mass, the GI anti-war movement, until 70, 71, or 72. The bulk of the American people didn't oppose the Vietnam War until the GIs came home and told them what to think. So, as for what SDS did with the draft, we did draft counseling, some people did, telling people how to get out of the draft. Um, we tried to throw ROTC off campus, and in some places did. The rim burned some ROTC buildings. What else comes into that category? As you were saying, the actions we took against the war. Oh, uh, this, uh, what was in the high Is that enough? Okay. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not sure. It's and, student, student tribes that shut down the schools. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure that it was even a good idea to oppose the draft. <clears throat> Some of the Leninist parties, Socialist Workers Party, PL, the Spartacist, pointed out that Lenin had never told anybody not to join the Tsarist army and started sending people into the army. That's how we got the GI anti-war movement was people went in, they were very popular with the troops because the troops were, they saw that war, <laughs> right? <clears throat> they did good and very successful work. Far more important to the anti-war movement's influence was the GI anti-war movement, which succeeded, which came after the student movement. And the, the first part of your question was what? Oh, no, I can, uh, I, I used my two minutes, so okay. I can't yeah, let it go. Let's move on to the question. Okay. So, um, have you heard of the Four People's Campaign? Oh, yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you could give us some insight on your thoughts of the, this new revival with Reverend Barber and others, but also if you could give us some insight on after, I believe, the last two or three years of MLK's life, when he was working on this, and if SDS or any of all these other things were possibly working together to achieve common goals. First, let me tell you about Moral Monday, <clears throat> or Poor People's Campaign, as it's called. 
I was in North Carolina when the Moral Mar Reverend Barber organized the Moral Monday movement. Both my wife and I were arrested this summer of 2013. 950 people went to jail. <clears throat> It was a pretty good movement in North Carolina where anybody can get to the state capitol in three hours. Most of the people who submitted to arrest were from the state capitol, Raleigh. Most of them were middle-aged whites, 80 to maybe more than 80%. The movement did not attract black male young people. It had some weaknesses. <clears throat> it, Reverend Barber had in previous years, he was head of the NAACP in North Carolina, had told, the Workers' World Party would go to his demonstrations to hand out newspapers and his people would come around and say, you can't do it. <laughs> he dropped that rule. <laughs> That speaks well of it. It's this question of communist exclusion again. The kids who pushed down the monument in Durham, by the way, Workers' World Party, conspiracy. They were guilty. That's my line. And I know them. Uh, but anyway, <coughs> Barbara and them mobilized at one time 15,000 people when the teachers joined us built a mass movement. I think there are problems with that movement. In Texas, I ain't going to spend a day riding to Austin to go to jail in Austin at the Capitol when the legislature ain't in session. I think the, moral, I think the Poor People's Campaign should take up the fair hike in Dallas. <laughs> if they go to do anything local, I'm with them. They have one limitation. The only solution they see is orthodox politics. They are a front for the Democratic Party. You will never hear them criticize the Democratic Party. So there's some downsides. But I attended two of their meetings here wanting to get involved again. It, Reverend Barber preaches the, tries to be the reincarnation of Dr. King's writings. I say his writings because there's something important to be said there. Dr. King wrote that he was the prophet of nonviolence, which means, white folks, we forgive you. We're not going to harm you. He had to say that because black people were only 12% of the population, and if he'd said what Malcolm did, he'd have been dead a lot, <laughs> a lot earlier. <laughs> Down in the trenches, in the field, we all believed in armed self-defense. We didn't believe in killing white people, but if they came to kill you, we didn't believe in turning the other cheek, right? You won't find that in Dr. King. <laughs> You won't find him saying armed self-defense. Dr. King gets whiter every year, less red and less black. I'll just tell you that. It breaks my heart when his birthday comes and I turn on the TV and they say we won. Like hell, we won a few crumbs. People got in that movement not because black people didn't get in that movement because they wanted to socialize with whites. They knew white people for what they were. You think black people in Alabama wanted to socialize with whites? Hell no. They got in that movement because they wanted better, as my local leader used to say, racial peace means black people get a piece of house, a piece of car, and a piece of job. They wanted good houses, good cars, and good jobs. They were Americans, <laughs> right? And if they had to associate with white people to get them, all right, we'll put up with it. But this we love everybody nonviolent stuff, which you'll get from Reverend Barber, was concocted to win over white moderates to support of the civil rights movement. One time I asked, I worked with a guy whose job was 
Whenever King went up north to raise funds, he'd call this guy Jimmy Collier, I worked with him in Alabama, to go touring with him. Jimmy Collier would play the guitar and sing before Dr. King spoke. He was the warm-up act for Dr. King. So he knew King pretty well. And I asked him one day, I said, Jimmy, does Dr. King believe all this nonviolent stuff? And he said, I asked him that question myself once, and he said, the Bible tells us we must be as innocent as doves and as wise as serpents. <laughs> now, what does that mean, right? Dr. King did what he had to do. He's a great hero. He said what he had to say. But to say that his speeches gives us an accurate picture of that movement is to mistake PR for history. Was there another part of your question, or did I answer it? Is that enough? That was great. Uh, any more questions? And feel free to raise your hand at any time. I see Ron. Any, any other hands? Josh? Anyone else want to get on stack? Dylan? Flynn? Okay, go ahead, Ron. I was just curious, uh, you said you got kicked out of tech for, for being an integrationist. Like, what, what got you into like, thinking about integration? In well, who knows? It was an issue when I was in high school. I was a good, I was vice president of the Young Democrats at Texas Tech. I kept up with those things. Did, did anybody else from like your town or wherever? Think the same thing? Or? Hell no. no. <laughs> well, in high school, I had one buddy, and we integrated the one cafe in town, but we were both white. It had a kitchen where it served black folks. So in high school, we went to that kitchen, and they served us. <laughs> we, 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 how do you say? But no, it was... And I wasn't thrown out of Tech for it. My father moved me from Tech to Panhandle a and At Tech, I had been working in a mimeograph shop at the university, turning out publications for student organizations. I was hired, the student union did it. And one day they gave me a fraternity songbook. And I was running it off, and I noticed that some of the lyrics were like those that came up in a scandal a couple of years ago. And I went downstairs and I said, I'm not running this off. And they didn't know what to make of me. They didn't fire me. Then I took a copy of what I had run off to the NAACP. <laughs> And I got in a bunch of trouble. I mean, people started throwing bottles through my windows in the dorm, and it was a big mess. But uh, I will not speculate about my motives because, essentially because I believe we're all more like dogs than like the rational people we think we are. And we don't know why we do what we do. And. It certainly ain't because I'm smarter than anybody else or more moral than anybody else. I won't present proof for either, but, or if I haven't already presented it, I won't try to present it. But certainly, I, I don't know why that is. I know that conditions produce everybody in this room. And if the conditions are right, it will produce more people like the people in this room. And it doesn't have much to do with us as individuals. Uh, Josh? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned earlier in your talk about 20% um, of people in the group, given group that you were with, doing 90% of the work. Mm -hmm. um, is that just as like we join organizations and we may see that, is that just the natural tendency of a group? or? Would you make any recommendations to how, how to get more people involved with doing the, the work? Well, if I've got any recommendations, it's this. You don't get into any campaigns that you have to explain to people. I'll give you an example. I, I work on the Fair Hike Committee. I don't have to explain to anybody why they should be against a hike on dark fairs, <laughs> right? 
Me you work on Medicare for all. It don't take much explaining. All you got to do is say the old people have it and they love it. <laughs> so the closer you stay to the ground, the simpler your issues are, the more, more you're going to involve that other 80%, or for that matter, the whole country. And that's where the left tends to go wrong. We want to know what you think of the situation in North Korea or Venezuela today or Israel-Palestine. And these are all good issues for us as intellectuals and to keep our minds alive, but they're not good mass issues. And that, if I have any suggestion, that's it. The other thing is I want to draw a little bigger contrast between an organization and a movement. I'm right now studying a guy, doing research on a guy who was sent to Alabama in 1930 to organize the Communist Party, sent from Ohio, a white guy. And he did a very courageous job in Alabama. I mean, you, you don't want to be in Birmingham, Alabama in 1930 holding meetings with black folks. That was illegal, <laughs> right? Courageous guy. And I'm now looking at Ohio, and there's a big difference in the notes. He was in charge of the operation in Alabama, and there's almost no record of what he did. When he was in Ohio, he was like number two or three in the party. They wrote long minutes of every meeting, Report, statistical reports, all this. They had an organization, right, a structure. Alabama was a movement. Ohio was, a, was an organization. You want your organizations to be as movementy as they can be, meaning as ad hoc, informal, structureless, disciplinedless, to make it possible for anybody to participate without having to go to school. Does that make sense? Learn rules and all of that stuff. Um, and. So his time in, in Ohio bores me a little bit. His time in Alabama scares the death out of me. And okay. Going back to questions I saw, uh, got on stack about Alex and Glenn, and I saw Taylor again. Anyone else want to ask a question, make a comment? Gene, I'm shocked that you have to raise your hand. Or you're going <laughs> for the last word, I bet. <laughs> I'll just add you the stack in. That my reputation. Yeah. And you can raise your hand at any point, just catch my attention, and I'll write you down. So, Alex? Oh, uh, well, I guess I, looking at the, I, and I know you've said this, like what the progressive labor brought was the word anti imperialism to the, I mean, what was it? But, I mean, in, in terms of not needing to, I mean, maybe not needing to discuss, like, whether you think uh, the Soviet Union was, like, wh what you think it was at different times, but, I mean, I know, just looking at, I haven't finished the Elbon book yet, but there was, I mean, I guess from the start, the important thing seemed to be, like, and I know you've always said that, like, an important thing for DSA is racially integrating the DSA. Like, that's the whole, I mean, a large part of the importance of the fair hike. Mm -hmm. Another important thing of, from this part of the movement was the centrality of anti-imperialism in addition to anti-racism. And that's sort of, I mean, to the degree that, I mean, that's something very different about the SDS from the DSA because, I mean, from, it seems to me, because then you had a living anti-war movement that was central to the movement, and the civil rights movement was the central issue of the movement. And it's perhaps not so much in the DSA. I mean, I think the DSA, you know, just looking at this room, the DSA, I mean, and I'm sure the S, I mean, I don't know if the SDS was better or worse on that score, but... On what score? Well, I mean, in terms of being racially integrated. Nah, SDS was 97% white. <coughs> 
So, I mean, I guess... 95. So, I mean, how would you... I mean, in terms of, like, reviving an anti-war movement and uniting the working class across boundaries of race, how would you say that the DSA could improve? I have an idea for DSA. In any DSA chapter in a town which has a military base, they should set up a committee to start working with the soldiers. That's the best anti-imperialist work DSA could do. Because when they speak, the country will listen. When the rest of us speak, we're just people with opinions about things that essentially are unknowable to Americans. I'm, I, I still defend Maduro in Venezuela. What difference does it make? <laughs> You're only going to attract white intellectuals if you start dealing with sophisticated issues. Vietnam was not sophisticated to us as students because we were facing the draft. Now that we're not, it's going to be real hard to have an anti-imperialist movement unless you start with soldiers. I guess just okay, sorry, don't have oh, okay. time for follow-ups, really. Or maybe the draft was universally the draft was a good force for opposition because it was universal, right? Everybody united against right. the draft because it applied to everybody, <clears throat> and that's exactly why they abolished it. That if you want to if you want to get rid of the opposition, you fragment the force. Worked. Yeah. Um, but, so there's an element of this that I just want to get back to. As you said at the very beginning, you alluded to um, some worries that you have about the DSA movement in terms of, you know, I'm guessing in terms of ideological fragmentation. Um, you know, in the way of past this prologue, what lessons do, do you have to, that, about that fragmentation that, that you would give to us to avoid that sort of... Well, the first one would be that you belong to Dallas DSA, and yes, there's a national office in Chicago, which is better than New York, but so what? <laughs> Meaning... I learned this by watching editors. Every editor's life centers around the six blocks around his house <laughs> or his office. That's the world to him. For that matter, that's the world to the rest of us. Stay close to home. The danger, at, uh, DSA now has national factions, right? The danger is that the local groups will begin to consider their relationship to those national factions as important and will begin to fight over party line questions that are far from home. Does that make any sense? That's exactly, how they, huh? that's exactly what's happened to the Democratic Party, right? You have local races, you have ACC. I'm sorry, Ali. Uh. <laughs> that may be one of the things that happened to the Democratic Party, but first it was bought. <laughs> Um, last call for any more questions from someone who hasn't spoken yet. Okay, we, we're going to try to get out a little bit before 9, just out of respect to the folks who are staying to let us uh, you know, be in this office so they can get away. Can I ask um, Gene a so, question? Yeah, well, actually, I was going to I was going to give Gene the floor first. <laughs> oh, okay. And then maybe we can do a few minutes if people want to come up and have more informal uh, discussion as we're, you know, rearranging the chairs and stuff. Uh, you're okay. welcome to do that. And, you know, ask, ask some more questions. Go ahead, Gene. <coughs> what did you want to ask? Did I say anything wrong? Yes. Yeah? <laughs> what was it? Well, you know I'm a Leninist. <laughs> yeah? I would call myself that, but go ahead. Yeah, well, you're telling everybody that, you know, you don't really need to try to work out a program. Everybody that's here wants to find that program. Mm -hmm. And uh, so do I, and so do you. So I think you're being a little lackadaisical about it. I've been trying 50 years and not much luck, but go ahead. So have I. But, but uh, you know, it's a long, this is a long arc of history. And my question is, uh, I'll have to frame it. I think that we're in the middle of the biggest upsurge in American history. I don't think that the anti-war movement of the, of the 60s and 70s can compare to the, to the absurds that we're in right now. 
And so I was wondering if that's what you thought. It's not what I think. <laughs> um, I think we will know who we are in November. <clears throat> and that November may present us with a reverse that's disastrous if the Republicans are reelected. If the Democrats get back in, then we can keep on doing what we're doing now. But um, I, I think the, the Democratic Party has offended a generation. That's why DSA exists. But they offended my generation, and what followed was years of reaction. They defended our generation. Now, they say they offended our generation. So I don't know yet. But if you know, that's fine, huh? Okay, I think that's going to be a wrap up for the formal part of tonight. Let's thank Dick one more time.